Now I'm very excited to present Professor Shabit Sagar. He is an executive di director of the Australian Center of Student Equity and Success at Curtin University. He has a very impressive set of experience across UK and Australia and maybe some other countries that I could be missing. I um, am very excited to hear more about Shamit's uptake and I idea of um, what Universities Accord has been talking about in terms of uh, student welfare, safety and well-being nationwide. And I'm very excited that Professor Shamit has dedicated time to meet with us today. But now, uh, without any further ado, thank you so much, Professor Shamit. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Anna. Um, just, can everyone hear me? Just going to look for a couple of nods on the screen, yeah? Okay, that's good. Yeah. So, as Anna said, I'm Shamit Sagar. I'm a professor here at Curtin on the West Coast. And my formal title is I'm the executive director of something called ACCESS. That stands for the Australian Centre for Student Equity and Success. So, it's kind of a neat acronym, I guess. Um, we were uh, rebranded and relaunched um, in the last year, and I became the director in that last period of time. Um, we are very, very specifically a kind of what work centre. That's a bit of jargon. A what work centre is a place where we boil down lots and lots of research that practitioners can use, and those are the practitioners that are running Australian universities. And in particular, to make those universities uh, more friendly and more amenable for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. In Australia, we call those, those groups of people, uh, we refer to that as student equity. In other countries, you refer to it as widening participation or educational inclusion. There's lots of different ways in which you can describe something very similar. Anyway, that's my day job. I do that sort of um, round the clock. And on the other side of that door behind me, there are 20 people working round the clock. And do do look at um, our website and see the kind of things we're up to. Research, policy, um, trials, evaluation, lots and lots of quite formal um, methodological forms of uh, analysis, but all of which gets boiled down. And I often say we don't have the luxury of keeping our insights to ourselves. We are required because of our funding to take it to 39 universities, starting for the vice chancellor downwards. Um, so that's just a bit of background. I can talk more about that, but I think that that's tangential. Um, I'm speaking to you, um, what's the time? Just gone 12 o'clock here from the West Coast. It's coincidental that you've asked me to speak at your event today. Um, today is the day of the Australian budget in Canberra. And as part of that budget, where Jace, uh, where the Treasurer um, Chalmers will get up in, um, in Canberra and say, you know, we have lots of money or we're broke or whatever, whatever Treasurer say, um, there'll be a document that will be dropped as part of that in which he will be providing the government's formal response to the university's accord. Uh, you mentioned, Anna mentioned that a moment ago. The university's accord is an 18 month exercise in a strategic review of higher education in Australia. And it's very clear the final report says that Australia needs to pretty much double its capacity in higher education, many more students going to university in the future, um, much closer alignment with higher education and vocational, many new programs, a lot of universities working at the cutting edge of research and working that back into the new economy. I mean, there's lots of things you can get into, okay, in the Accord, there's some, kind of something for everyone. But there's two things that stand out. And, and one is the one that I'm quite passionate about, which is um, having students from disadvantaged backgrounds go to university, but not just that, but also succeed. So to graduate, having come onto campus in the same numbers as non-disadvantaged students, and also coming onto campuses and getting degrees in um, not just some universities in Australia, but all universities. You want to avoid a ghettoization where, um, you know, to use a stereotype, people, you know, as poor kids in poor universities, you just definitely want to avoid that. So we're trying to, you know, make sure this is an agenda for everyone, not for no reason is our strap line universities for all. So that's one big theme that you can look at, and I can say more about that. There's clear recommendations in the final report that support that objective. And the other recommendations that I think important are the ones that support the sector as a whole, and the sector um, 
is if it if it, if this works, yeah, you know, ten years from now, fifteen years from now, we'll have Australian universities more successful in sort of plugging into the global knowledge economy. Countries all over the world have worked out for many years that their economic future lies in knowledge economies. Uh, more and more know-how, discovering new things, applying them, turning them into things that, um, you know, innovation in every sector of our society, whether it's tech enabled or not tech enabled, um, this is the future of the global economy. That's where value will be added. Um, and frankly, you would go to universities to be part of that global knowledge economy. And Australia essentially is lagging behind right now, unless we um, uplift our game. And that leads to a very big part of what the accord is trying to get across. But you can tune in and listen to what uh, the treasurer has got to say for yourself, for himself later on today. Um, I was asked to comment on a couple of areas of the accord. As you know, there's some recommendations uh, number 18 and 19, which are very much about the student experience, the student facing part of the accord. And I'm going to respond to that in a second, um, but by making the following point, which is that um, it's all good and well to say we need more universities, more university places, more students. And I'm not against that. OK, but it really begs the question, which is what do you want all these students to do? Do you want just them to do more of the same or do you want to try to change institutions to make them different, better, whatever, whatever, okay? And I think the, the, the argument is in favor of doing different and better. And there's a couple of areas that stand out. One is the obvious one, which is um, we wanna make sure that these, you know, 40 odd universities, or there may be, you know, another 20 in the future, that they're as student centric as possible. So I'll stop that, bit of jargon, student centric. You know, people just use jargon all the time. Student centric is a shorthand way of describing how you run a university for the benefit of students. The problem with higher education internationally, I've been around in universities for about 30 or 40 years, way longer than you care to imagine. But not so long ago, and maybe to some extent even today, universities are generally being run not for the benefit of students, but for the benefits of professors, people like myself. Um, so we call that in the jargon producer centric. I'm a producer of knowledge. Your users, students are users. And so the accord is trying to reshift that balance away from professors, people like me, and in favor of people like yourself. I think it's a very good thing um, because you want to make sure that, well, students will know probably a fair bit about how they learn. They probably know as much, if not more, than their professors. Of course, professors are there for content knowledge. I'm not saying they're not. And we're very important as a partnership. But, but the idea that you, you would learn because I decide how you learn is a very antiquated idea, very old fashioned idea indeed. So that's just what goes on in the classroom or the seminar room or the lecture theater. But student centric also has to do with things like how easy it is it to access your university? How easy is it to get there with transport links? How easy or difficult is it to fund your, uh, your studies? how difficult it is to get, or easy it is to get an extension in your essay, et cetera, et cetera, you can go on. There's so many things that make for a student-centric experience or not, right? The opposite is a non-student-centric experience. When you come onto campus, um, you're vaguely told that professors will educate you. Um, you may or may not meet a professor. Um, you, you're, you're, you're given knowledge as, as a given, as opposed to as a learning process. So it can be completely the wrong way around. So this is about shifting things from here to over here. And let's just say for argument's sake, we're halfway on that uh, area. So it also includes things like the things I've been asked to comment upon. So a student charter is an obvious example, and so is an ombudsman. So I'll specifically say something about that. And I'm looking at Anna in terms of my time, so I want to leave enough time for discussion and questions. You'll hear from my accent, I come from the UK. I've uh, spent a lot of my career there, but I've also worked in North America as well as Australia. Um, so the student charter, as you'll know, has a long UK pedigree. You know, universities adopted a charter or charters, you know, some time ago. Um, some are effective, some are less effective, but it's the signal that's sent that the university um, is focused upon whatever is in the charter. You can have a short charter or a long charter. You can have lots of things you put in there. But by and large, it should be a series of things that are not too difficult to observe and measure about the university being student centric. Right. So that, you know, the library is there 
in a way that you can make use of it. The car park is there. I mean, I could go on, but up to everything up to and in fact, including what happens in the seminar room, right? So that the reading material is accessible. The learning process has a kind of, if you want, a kind of, um, you know, a kind of, uh, in, you know, sort of a, a quid pro quo. You know, you, you teach, you learn, it sets off a feedback cycle in which the learning process promotes better teaching. That better teaching hits hits the cycle and goes towards better learning. So there's, a, if you want, a virtuous cycle, okay? So the student charter is important. Many universities have adopted such as this, this, this sort of thing in the UK. The difficulty is always being crystal clear. You know, they can be set at a kind of very high level. So you want to be able to convert this into something that's observable, touchable and sort of measurable. And I think it's no secret that universities struggle with that um, in terms of, you know, most institutions don't want to make too many commitments, um, but you can see you know, the problem that they have. Okay, And it's related also to the other point about an ombudsman. The UK has an ombudsman. It's just called something different. It's called the uh, uh, National um, Adjudicator. The Office of the National Adjudicator is a very horrible title. Okay, But what it means is there's someone independent of the university that you can go to with your concern stroke complaint. And your complaint could be and normally how ombudsman work is in the following, which is it can be about service or it can be about standards or conduct, we sometimes call that. So you could have service type complaints, which is if the professor or the department says essays are marked within two weeks or three weeks and they clearly are not, then you've got a service problem, haven't you? Yeah. So you can take that to university. If you're not happy with that, you can eventually take it to an independent party, the ombudsman. And then there's conduct or standards or professional you know matters where you're unhappy about the the actual conduct of the university rather than the service standards um in other words in worst case scenario you've taken a course and it's not fit for purpose yeah it turns out that it just doesn't do anything remotely that, that's described by the, the label okay that's obviously very very rare but Many complaints can be made up of a combination of service as well as if you want conduct here. Yeah? Um, but the, it doesn't really matter. The point is that you can go to someone outside the university because the university could always be accused um, of marking its own homework, saying, yeah, you know, we've looked at this very, very carefully, Anna, and, and absolutely we can assure you that you're wrong. And Anna might take the view, say, well, but you would say that, wouldn't you? So that's the purpose of going independent. So broadly, you can hear my voice, I'm supportive of that. <laughs> Um, you know, and why am I supportive? I think it's good for universities. I think it's for students. It's actually in common with every other industry, you know, where you can go to a ombudsman if you if you fall out with providers in that industry. In other words, if they've fallen short, you should be able to go to something beyond members of that industry. So why universities think that they should be separate or different kind of escapes me. So I'm broadly in support of that. And the last thing, and I'm just going to probably wind up because time. Um, is on the student services and amenities fee. Now that's obviously been a little bit more contentious. Um, you don't need me to rehearse the arguments for and against. It is very much the subject of um, the announcement that will be dropped later this afternoon in Canberra. So I'm clearly not gonna tell you what that is or let alone my view on it. That would be a bit, bit um, remiss. But I do think if universities are gonna have a compulsory levy on students and say, we're taking money from you for broadly student related purposes as it were or student facing services that's got that you want to be as specific as possible yeah because you don't want to leave that open-ended and that's presumably where that recommendation came from and, and i think your organization is obviously in support of that you'd want that money handed over early either as a whole or in in large part to organizations that are at least student-led or student facing um that's not to say that some of it shouldn't be spent by universities for students um, because universities might have um, initiatives or programs which they can clearly show are in the student interest or benefit students. So there's a discussion to be had, but I think it's quite hard for universities to hang on to all that money um, with a compulsory levy and say, we're not interested, you know, students, student led organizations can't have that. So look, I mean, it's a complicated way of saying you're gonna come up with a messy compromise. But I don't think the arguments won clearly one way or the other. You know, I've looked at this number of universities across the world, and it's not entirely clear one way is actually better than the other. 
probably, um, I, this is going live, so I shouldn't really say this, probably there's some politics involved in this, probably um, not giving these levies and the funds directly to student organisations comes with strong opinions about um, students that people hold politically. I don't hold those views, I, I'm, I don't, but I'm, very, I'm not naive, I'm perfectly well aware of the fact that people do hold those views. Um, and in extremists, some people would say, well, aren't, you, you know this trope, you know, you, aren't students meant to go to university and learn about stuff and get, go and get jobs versus they're sitting around all day drinking coffee and being political or something. You know, that's a standard sort of stereotype that gets played. Um, there's not much in it. I don't really agree with it at all. But that, that kind of politics sloshes around, I suppose. Last comment, universities continue to be, and you'll know this, highly exposed, both students and professors, to political arguments about um, the role of higher education. Uh, even the most casual observer will no notice what's been happening in Columbia University and now on the lawn outside me at Curtin University. Uh, th these are things you can have opinions about. My point is very simple, that universities are more and more in the front line about these arguments, which are really about global political arguments. I'm not saying they shouldn't be on the front line, but you can see how they're exposed if people want to have a go at universities. Um, they, they, it's, it's kind of natural if you want to have a go at universities to, to drag all this up. So the, the fee, the levy thing, I think sometimes gets, you know, some of these political arguments get, get sort of smuggled in um, around that, okay? And I'm going to shut up. I've gone on for long enough. I don't know if that's what you wanted. I've done my best to sort of cover all, all bases. I'm really happy to listen to discussion or try to answer the questions as best I can. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, I really appreciate the, your your take on this. And uh, Creole, did you have a first question? Awesome. So I might kick us off with the questions. Can you hear me, Professor? Live and clear. Go for it. Great. So I thought it was really interesting what you mentioned initially regarding that universities generally run for the benefits of professors. So it's more of a producer centric over a student centric mm. focus. Mm. Um, in terms of trying to gain the feedback that we need in order to create a more student centric approach, how do you think that um, or could you describe the impact of student feedback on educational policy just based on your experience? There's so many things that come to mind. I mean, look, in the old days, you wrote a set of questions for students to write essays on, you know, in my field and other fields. They wrote answers and then you sort of told them it was any good and that was the end of it. You probably didn't even give them any comments when I first started. So things have moved on. Um, and now I think you want to have, I mean, standard practice to sort of have a criteria to say, you know, is it according to this, that and the other, blah, blah, blah. Is it, you know, is it, is it good or is it bad or here's room for improvement? That's an easy example. Um and students can follow that. It's 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 designed to be read and digested. It's not designed. It's not it's not the thought that in the professor's mind that matters. It's the thought in the student's mind when they read it that matters. That's what matters, isn't it? And so you design your feedback feedback in 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 those terms. And you can get better at it, or you can you know look at best practice in your school or your department and try to get better and better. But that trend line is in favour of asking. You know, imagine you know. Um, you know, Priol is my student and I'm teaching her, blah, blah, blah. And I write, you know, half a page of notes. OK, yeah, but does, the point is not what my note, what I was thinking is, this, does she actually get benefit from that? Does she think to say, oh, yeah, I can really see or I can't see, you know, like blah, blah. There's something for her to sort of say, OK, well, I've learned something, not just by listening to the lectures, blah, blah, and writing the essay, but also having have it, having had it marked so that it, there's a continuous sort of feedback loop, okay? So that's a very simple example, you know? And, you know, another example would be, you know, using teaching materials nowadays, which are, um, you know, hyperlinked, accessible teaching packs, you know, all this sort of stuff where the, the material in support of whatever I'm teaching a student or a group of students is highly curated, you know, rather than just a random reading list of stuff that goes on and on and on about without any sense of, you know, which, what does it relate to, except vaguely the topic, but a curated, um, you know, reading list or reading pack or teaching pack or whatever we want to call these things, where it's very, very pointed to support particular things that I'm teaching about or particular debates particular arguments. I mean, I, I, you know, I've not been regularly, I've been running research institutes for the last 10 years, but when I was teaching, 
um, towards the end of my sort of teaching career. Not that it's over, but I'm just making the point that I was very keen on making a very curated things available to students, particularly about current debates around X, Y, and Z, you know? Um, and there's so much material out there. I spend a lot of time reading, that's my job. And to get that the absorption of knowledge from the professor into the minds of the students should be the priority. So this, these are all student-centric ways of doing it. So it's less producer-centric. If you listen to what I'm saying carefully, you'll notice there's a partnership. This is not about being anti-professor and pro-student. It's about being pro both of them. Yeah, so they both rise, not one goes down and the other. It's just that the old days, if you don't mind me saying so, were very obviously not student-centric. It's obvious to see. You know, I, I won't bore you with stories, but plenty of examples. And the trend line has been moving away from that. Plus, in some countries like the UK, the cost of our education has become very, very expensive. So it's not that surprising that students have sort of said, what am I getting for my money? You know, and sort of become more consumer centric. Now, being student centric and more consumer centric, not the same thing. I'm not in favor of students be going, becoming consumers. To some extent, I understand why they are, but I'm not that sympathetic because consumerism in universities means what's in it for me. Yeah. And that becomes very divisive. Students, you will end up with a situation you often see in American campuses where students are running around telling professors that, you know, how much is costing them per minute to be in a seminar and essentially using a backdoor way to negotiate higher grades. It's a very, very divisive culture that consumerism. I don't think it's a good thing, frankly. I can understand being consumerist about the price of, I don't know, photocopying or whatever in the library. You know, if you feel that it's a bad value, you can be consumerist. But your relationship with your professors shouldn't be consumerist. It should be a partnership. Um, so anyway, I can go on, but I think these are some things I've observed. I, I could expand, but time doesn't allow us. And you'll know many more examples yourselves in your own teaching settings of things that you find student-centric um, which could easily be, sorry, not student-centric, but could easily become student-centric. Thank you so much. Um, I have a second question. I think we have time for one more question. So we have a bit of a discussion after. Um, but I do just want to see your opinion or vision on, um, let's say, you just imagine that, you know, we go with, uh, we go ahead with creating some sort of student charter in future. Mm. How do you envision including um, diverse uh, representative voices um, of students across Australia in creation of that? Well, I mean, I, I can't comment in detail, but I think it'll be through a consultative process. I mean, there's no perfect mechanism for consulting any group about anything. There's always, always imperfect mechanisms. I think having a cross-section of student opinion around the table on drafts or final versions, I think is perfectly okay. Um, I wouldn't say it's the most important thing, it's quite important, okay? Um, but ask yourself a very simple question. If you had a charter for any industry, would you keep users out of it? It's a very simple thing. You wouldn't run it, you wouldn't draft a charter for a hospital and say it's got nothing to do with patients. So why would we so it's quite an easy argument to win if you want if you want that. But once you have the students around the table, I think you then have a second set of issues, which is guess what? Not all students want the same thing. To some extent they do, but sometimes they want different things. And so then you have to work out issues to do with what do they want most of the time, mostly, you know, on average, as it were. So that by definition excludes some groups of students. So this is much easier said than done. Historically, universities are places for the middle class or the upper middle class. And so the students who come onto campuses, by definition, are the children of the middle class and upper middle class. And they are often the last people or amongst the last people to recognize how um, unwelcoming a university can be from for, for, for people from a, uh, a working class background or a first and family background or a uh, indigenous background or a low socioeconomic background. So you, even if you've got lots of students around the table helping you, you know, work out the charter, it's possible you might have the wrong students. Um, in other words, they, they, they all like each other. They're all very similar. They don't look at, they don't really remind you of the new groups of students that we'll need in the future as we expand Australian higher education. By definition, we're going to have to have a lot of people from non-traditional backgrounds, you know. And my centre focuses upon low socioeconomic status, regional and rural, indigenous, and people with disabilities. 
but you could expand that, you know? So I'm kind of with you, and I kind of say the point, but I, I've not yet been persuaded that um, that we're as good as getting people from non-traditional backgrounds around the table. That requires real effort and real skill. Wonderful, thank you. That's I think really sets the great uh, mood for the discussion later today. Thank you so much for the presentation and I'm joining us today. <laughs> sure, I'm delighted. Anything I can do in the future or my team, let me know, okay? Thank you so much.